Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. My name is Jimmy Smith, and I am the host of the Rambler Podcast. I just want to take a moment to say I hope you all had an amazing Christmas season with friends and family, and I just want to wish you the very best start of your new year. I pray that 2023 will prove to be your very best year yet. Uh, So yeah, now let's get back into the podcast, episode number 12, featuring Charles Rush. Hello everyone, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to episode number 12 of the Rambler Podcast where we are passionate about sharing what makes Cathedral Prep the standard of excellence from highlighting the successes of our Prep or Villa alumni base as well as highlighting the people, the faculty or staff who help make Prep great for our students today. On this episode of the podcast, we are thrilled to have Charles Rush as a guest on the podcast. Charles graduated from Cathedral Prep in 2001 and played football during his time here. He was voted Associated Press State Player of the Year, Gatorade Player of the Year, a finalist for the inaugural High School Heisman Award, a Parade All-American selection, and a second team USA Today All-American his senior year, where he led the Ramblers to their first ever state championship. Charles then went on to play football for Penn State University, where he became a three-year starter as an offense alignment, having started 31 games. During his time at Penn State, they won the Big Ten Championship in 2005 and then went on to an overtime victory over Florida State in the 2006 Orange Bowl. Charles graduated from Penn State with a degree in economics. After his playing career ended, Charles went on to spend one year as an interim with the Legal Operations Department of the NFL's Management Council. He emerged with a thorough understanding of how the league's salary cap works and got to spend some time with the NFL executives, including Commissioner Roger Goodell, which helped him determine the next phase of his career. He then went on to Pittsburgh's Katz Graduate School of Business, where he graduated in 2010. After that, Charles became a district sales manager for Erie Insurance, and then eventually went on to Villanova University School of Law, where he graduated from in 2015, as well as City University of Hong Kong in 2015 for economic law. Nowadays, he is currently an associate at Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Washington, D.C., where he advises organizations on risk management, and import compliance issues with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Charles represents clients regarding national security issues and export control matters with the U.S. federal agencies such as Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, and the Department of Treasury. Outside of his professional endeavors, Charles serves on the Board of Directors for Cathedral Prep and Mother Teresa Academy and has been an advisory council member at George Washington University School of Business. Earlier this year, Charles was also named a member of the nation's top 100 black lawyers. Uh, So Charles, welcome to the podcast. We're happy to have you on. Thank you, Jimmy. It's always a great opportunity to be able to speak to the prep community, and I greatly appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. No, we're thankful. I know I reached out to you a little bit ago. You don't live in Erie, live Correct. down in Virginia. Correct. So glad we could finally link up and have you on as a guest. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Anything I can do for our school, I'm more than willing to do. So yeah. I appreciate your time. Yeah. So, so let's get started here. When you decided to go to prep, um, what was the decision that led you to be here? Well, I think for any kid that... Ooh, like myself, was born and raised in Erie. Prep is kind of <laughs> mainline into <laughs> your stream of consciousness from a young age. And I'd say probably two of the main um, factors in my decision to go to prep is one was my cousin. Mm. My cousin, uh, David Dix. He mm. was about three years older than me. And he grew, he's a black Catholic, grew up in drunk the prep Kool-Aid from a young age, <laughs> was very excited about it, and his excitement got me excited about the school. And he went to prep for a few years and learning more about what the school had to offer academically, athletically, and just as a community yeah. had me excited. And also, as a young man, I was a rather large <laughs> young man to say the least. I was 250 pounds when I was 13 years old. Oh my goodness. So. I like to say the old 80s adjective, I was husky. (laughs) So I knew eventually I wanted to play Division I football. And if you go back at that time, back in the mid-90s, prep was the dominant and still is the dominant program within this area. Mm. So you had the 91 team back with Chris Feeney and Mark Tate and seeing what those guys were able to do and wind up going to Penn State. It was one of the motivating factors because I knew that Prep was a school that matched my ambition and yeah. where I could ultimately achieve my hopes and dreams 
while remaining in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's really cool to hear. So your aspirations were big from the beginning. You wanted to go play Division One football. Now I got to ask, when you came to prep, um, I don't say culture shock, but I mean, like you were going in anticipating you're going to work hard, right? Because you want to yes. play football long term. You're going to do well academically. But was it tough getting used to the rigors of what prep offered, or did you kind of just dive right in and you're all about it? That's an excellent question, Jimmy. Because I have to back up a little bit because you talk about culture shock and working hard. <sighs> Anyone knows knows my family is that yeah. that's ingrained in us and in my cousins and other relatives from the door yeah. from really from my parents Fred and Donna Rush knowing that anything that I do for the outside world is going to be put through the rigor yeah. for coming from them and having the discipline and dedication that I had going into prep prepared me and one of the things particularly academically why academic wise is that i went to erie day for grade school mm. because from my birth my parents thought that i received the best education that the community has to offer so yeah. i went to erie day from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade mm. and had wonderful experiences there and was truly prepared for my time academically when i came to prep but at the same time, though, and to be quite frank, and a lot, a lot of people know this, but my adjustment to prep was a difficult one. Mm. Because at the time, my father, who <laughs> anyone who knows, is extremely involved in my life. But at the same time, he took a job under Governor Ridge and mm. was working for Tom, uh, Tom Ridge at the time. And he was the executive director for Governor's Advisory Commission for African American Affairs. Mm. So he moved down to Harrisburg when I was about 13. Oh, wow. And from 13 to about 15, I noticed my dad not being there yeah. for a significant amount of my life. And my behavior changed. And I wasn't doing as well as I should have, particularly going from grade school to high school to the point that I had, I grad, my French, my great GPA my freshman year was a 1.8. Oh, jeez. And I had over 15 demerits. Wow. Had to go in front of the board of directors, board of review to talk about either you ship up or you shape out. Yeah. Ship out. And it's not due to the fact that in hindsight, 25 years later, that I was a bad kid or anything by, of that sort. But it's, right. and deep down, it's like I came to realize that like, I was just a 15-year-old kid who missed his dad. Mm. And my dad, seeing some of the struggles I was going through, being the man that he that he is and that he was at that point in time, still phenomenal. He moved back into town, and everything changed. Wow. Everything got better, and so from those fifteen demerits that I had my freshman year, I only had three my remaining three years. Wow! At prep, yeah, and let alone the success that we had football wise, which I know we can get into a little bit later. But yeah. it's just knowing that I had so many advantages. When coming into prep, coming from a loving, caring family, two, two parent household, and knowing that me, particularly as a black kid, coming to Cathedral Prep, predominantly white school, my freshman class at the time, we had the most black kids who have ever came to prep at the time. I think it was 13 of us. Wow. And it's an adjustment. Yeah. And even though it's an adjustment for being a black kid coming to prep, but at the same time, though, it's like, that wasn't really an adjustment for me because I came from Erie Day. Right. Where it, I was one of two yeah. in the whole school. Yeah. Out of 160 some kids. So coming from a loving parent household, not having to deal with a culture shock, and knowing that I still struggle with the adjustment, yeah. I take it upon myself as now a board, a, a director of the school to make sure that every single kid, no matter what their demographic is, yeah knows that there is a place for them at Cathedral Prep. Yeah. Particularly given the fact that now they were a co-ed institution, and this being the first year that we've adjusted to this new transition, it's imperative to know that whatever struggles a kid might be going through, that we are here to help them in whatever way possible. Yeah. Whether they vocalize that or if we see in academics or athletics that something's just not right, they're not performing to their maximum potential, that we're there to be able to help them get back on board, 
identify whatever the issue is, help remediate that, yeah. and then adjust forward. Yeah. Because I know, like I said, I had all the advantages and I struggled. There's so many other kids who don't have those advantages who might be struggling as well. And it's incumbent on us, the adults in the room, to make sure that every single one of our kids who their parents have entrusted yeah. us to mold their futures right. and prepare them for life, that they're getting the care and guidance that they deserve. Because that care and guidance is what made me who I am today. And I think that's the part where when I share my passion for prep and, mm -hmm. you know, we develop men and now women of vision. Yes. Through my yes. body, right? Yes. The mission statement sounds great, but it takes people like yourself and others who just care so much about the kids to spend that time to why I'm so passionate about the school is because I've seen it work in my life, yes. my friends' lives, and I see how we became different people in those four years where the joke was always, you're not making a four-year decision, you're making a 40-year decision. Correct, correct. There's a lot of truth to it. Yes, absolutely. And just the people that I met, the teachers, the coaches, and once we go through some more of the conversation, we'll <laughs> identify them. But no, it's just, it's truly a special place. And that's why I'm committed to it, to do whatever I can to make sure so as many kids as possible yeah. gets the same type of care, nurture, development, and structure that I received that has enabled me to go on to do well in my life. And one of the things that um, for the people who listen to the podcast consistently, I always talk about is asking some question about how do you balance your, your work life, right? Being a, a dad or a mom mm -hmm. and working with your kids. And I think to your point, how important it is for as a father or mother to be present in your kids' lives and not just be so absorbed with your work that Correct. you aren't there for your kids. Case in point, look at you with the testimony you have from your freshman year versus sophomore through senior year with Correct. your dad just being there. Correct. It's just so important. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and it's it's one of those things where it's like you appreciate it while you're young, but at the same time, the older you get, the more you appreciate it even more. Yeah, and that's just my family, let alone the coaches that I had, let alone a Mike Mishler, a Charles Heidelberg, a Chet Moffitt. Yeah, those individuals who saw potential in me and took times away from their own families right. to pour into me to make sure that I could be my best self. Yeah, It's something that's invaluable, and it's just the only thing you can't pay it back, but you can't pay it forward. Right. And it's just trying to do that as much as you can for the next generation. It's awesome. Well, we appreciate all the efforts you do. You're making it um, while you're on the board of directors here right. for us and what you're doing. We, we appreciate it. And, uh, you know, so, so looking back at your days at prep, you know, you played football on some pretty amazing teams. <laughs> you were a big part of those teams as well. Uh, I had Coach Cray on the podcast uh, back in August before the season started. We were mm -hmm. talking about his experience playing with those teams and his memories and whatnot. Right. Um, for yourself, you look back on those teams and maybe how special they were, the guys that were on there. What right. do you take away from that time with your that prep <sighs> football experience? I would say that it's easily one of the most transformative experiences of my life. Mm. And not just because we were successful on the field, but the relationships and the bonds that we developed off the field. Yeah. And that starts back from our 97 freshman football season. Mm. where Coach Mitchell was our, our coach, and we had Ed Hinkle, Joe Dupre, Jason Easter, Josh Lustig, and we went un, we didn't give up a point the whole season. Yeah. So undefeated, untied, and scored upon. And I still like messing with some of the kids today. We're talking about, oh, we might be the best freshman team ever. Well, did you give up a point? Well, yeah, we had one. Oh, right. We're done. We're done here. We're done here. Nothing else. That's all you got to ask. Exactly. We're done here. So we can debate about who's the best team ever, but best freshman team ever, there's no debate. And from this instantly, even before we stepped foot in the actual school, we developed a bond and camaraderie. And I think a lot of that even goes back to the fact that a lot of us grew up together. Mm. Like Jason and I, we played on the same 2B team, as well as uh, Josh Lustig. And Hinkle, Eric Field, and Mike Romack and I, we're on the same T-ball team together when we were seven years old. Yeah. So we it have so much talent that comes together. That's why I always tell kids, it's like, you need to appreciate your high school days because it's never going to be the same. Even if you go on the NFL, you, you can talk to a lot of my teammates from college that play in the NFL, and it's like, there's nothing like the bond that you develop with your high school teammates. Mm. Wow. And for us to have a bond even come into the school, let alone solidifying and fortifying that bond through ups and downs. Right. Because we 
didn't give up a point our sophomore year, our, our freshman year. Sophomore year, a lot of us that were do did well in freshman we got advanced up to varsity. Yeah. And 98 <sighs> was a great season, but at the same time, though, it's really one of those things, like, as long as I need to back up a little bit, because not just we advanced to, yeah. to varsity, but so did Coach Mishler. Right. So yeah. I always like to brag about the fact that it's like, yeah, Coach Mister was my high school coach. Yeah. I didn't have any other coach That's my, awesome. over my yeah. high school team. <laughs> and the thing that truly now being a 40-year-old man, I look, reflect on is how young he was when he coached us. He's yeah. only 29. Right. When he was coaching us and had a whole family in and of itself and just another fact of just how much he gave to us in sacrificing yeah. time away from his young, growing, now right. awesome family. But going through that time, we really, truly learned the difference between success and excellence. Mm. I remember our very first game, we played the Trobe, and we beat them 35 nothing. It was the Friday, the Saturday before Labor Day. I remember we had practice scheduled for Labor Day. And we, we thought, oh, you know, we just beat the Trobe 35 nothing. We won't, might not even practice today. That was the worst practice I've ever had in my life, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> because we won, but we did not play well. Mm. And because we did not play well, we, they, the coaches, impressed upon us that it doesn't matter what the scoreboard says. Mm. If you're not playing up to your potential, there will be prices to pay. Yeah. And we paid that price that day by running as many gassers as humanly <laughs> possible. And... It really truly set the tone for what we would become yeah. a dominant national power in right. football because it really truly did not matter what the scoreboard said. If we did not play up to our potential and to the best of our abilities, <laughs> there were repercussions to be had. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, 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 our film sessions were the stuff of legend. <laughs> Just three hours, check your pride at the door. And oh, man. And the upstairs too, we're, right? We're the upstairs, field house. Yep. upstairs of the old field house, yep. hot as can be, <laughs> and just many tears were shed. <laughs> many, many people were called out their names. <laughs> <laughs> and never mind the fact with Coach Moore, John, uh, Joe Moore, his influence on our teams. Because mm. as many people in the prep community know, Coach Moore was uh, the offensive line coach for Notre Dame's last national championship back in 1988. And he brought that same mentality to mm -hmm. us. And I always say there's nothing I learned about high, about football that I didn't learn at prep mm -hmm. because of his wow. influence as well as Coach Coach Mishler's. And we had so many excellent, outstanding assistant coaches. Yeah. Our Baker being one of them, arguably the greatest athlete in Erie history, yeah. was on our staff. And... He knew my dad very well, so he took a, a particular yeah. interest in my development. Yeah. And there are very few things that made me more proud than when he told me that I was a football player. Mm. Because if I did bad, he would let me know about it, call me everything but a child of God. <laughs> and if I did well, he'd be like, you just shake his head and be like, all right. Right. You're getting, you're getting better. You're getting there. Yeah. And Particularly him, like I said, Coach Moore, the amount of people that he helped get into NFL. Yeah. And when you did something right, which <laughs> you very rarely ever got acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like if you think he yelled at, all right, that's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> but if you actually did something right and you got a compliment, it meant so much to you. Yeah. Because you know the depth of football knowledge. Right. That was coming from that from such a good, sincere place. And it's one of those is like, and it goes to the old saying, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. We knew the coaches cared about us. Yeah. And because of that, they could drive us. <laughs> like no <laughs> and, other, right? <laughs> like no other. And um, he might be a little bit mad when I say this, what I'm going to say it. It's like Coach Mish, he comes, still comes to me this day, like, he said, there's no way I could do what to the, to the to today's kids what I did to y'all <laughs> <laughs> without being arrested <laughs> but it's a different time right it's, it's a different time but it's it worked 
Yeah. It absolutely worked. Right. And it was one of the best culminations of talent, football wise, hunger, desire, guidance, leadership, structure. And it was truly magical. Yeah. And the thing I think we appreciated even at the time is that we knew we were part of something special. Mm. And I remember talking to Dupre at one of our reunions a couple of years ago, and he was, we were just kind of remarking on how much pressure that we had. Yeah. Being in a national spotlight, playing high level competition, playing against some of the nat- top teams in the nation as well. Yeah. But at the same time, too, it's like we didn't feel that pressure mm. because we put that pressure on ourselves. Mm. And we expected to go out, not just win, but to dominate and to embarrass any person or any team that came against us. Right. And if we didn't do that, we make sure to make up for that next time. Yeah. And it's a, truly a mindset that never leaves you. Mm. Right. That you need to not just put numbers up on the board, but truly do your best. Mm in order to feel any type of satisfaction. Yeah. But even with that satisfaction, it's temporary because you know there's always more work to do and more yeah. work to be done. Yeah. And it truly was the perfect storm of talent and skill and even like strength wise with having Coach H. Yeah. Like a legend. Yeah. And a prep legend and an eerie legend because that man and anyone that sees him, particularly back then, 55 year old man who's ripped to shreds. It's like, <laughs> whatever that man is doing, I'm going to do it. Right. <laughs> that man can tell me to run through a wall to this day, I will do it. Like, and he's another one. He cares so much. Yeah. And I just feel bad that he does not get the respect and acknowledgement that he deserves because he has been transformative mm-hmm. in this school and has touched. Not just the athletes, but just the regular students yeah. that have walked the halls of Cathedral Prep. Everyone has a Coach J story. Yep. And he, I consider, honestly, I consider him to be like a second father to me. Wow. Because that, that man has had that much positive impact on my life. Wow. Not just athletically, but spiritually, emotionally. Like, they broke the mold when they made Charles Heidelberg. That's cool. So, it's just having that experience yeah. and being able to leverage that experience into the accolades that you mentioned is truly a blessing, but I think just the fact that we're able to achieve the school's first state championship yeah, makes it even more worthwhile. How cool to be able to say that you guys were a part of that team that did that. There's another thing that needs to be said. Yes, we're, I was a part of the team, but the 99 team, mm. My the team that I was a junior on, the yeah. team that Mike Cray was a senior on, does not get nearly enough credit that it deserves. Yeah, and quite frankly, I'm gonna be honest with you, Jimmy. The '99 team was a better team than 2010. Wow. If you think about it, hmm. no team gets better when they lose a dude that goes on to become the NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Right. Yeah. Let alone you have Eric Carlson. Yep. One of the top quarterbacks in school history as yep. a quarterback. Ed Hinkle, a, who would go on to become a four-year starter at Iowa, starting at wide receiver for us. Yeah. And the depth of a John Sitter, a Scott Kaczynski, Mike Cray. Yep. Like, that squad was, it was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. Love on the team speed that we had. Juwan and his ability. Like, we were good. In, we were great in, in 2000. But to say that just because we won, yeah, that makes it a better team. No. No. 99. Or the, Nine, yeah, 99 team. Yeah, and, and this is coming from a person. I gave the induction speech for the 2000 team <laughs> in the Club Hall of Fame. <laughs> and the brain and I, we always laugh about it. It's like, honestly, like the 99 team was the best team yeah. that the school has ever had. Yeah. And and for it coming to you, it carries more weight, right? Than some outside <laughs> perspective of someone to say that you lived it, breathed it. Yes. You, if there's anyone that knows, it'd yes. be one of you and, and, and a handful and of people. And I'd be remiss in not mentioning Jeff Bomba. Yeah. Who was my left guard on that team. And yeah. And anyone that knows Jeff, that he was such a wonderful person, a wonderful human being. And his presence is missed every yeah. single day. 
Yeah. And he was such a such a phenomenal person. He comes from a phenomenal family. Yeah. Mr. Bamba, I always <laughs> I always joke to call him Mr. Bamba Papa Smurf. And <laughs> he's such a great man, such a great family, and he's just another one of those components as to why that team was the best team in school history. Yeah. Because you had that class, that senior that class of two thousand yes. on top of my class, on top of the sophomores of class of two thousand two. Like we were you're not going to top. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I appreciate you sharing all that mm-hmm. about your, your pro football time and, you know, your, your very uh, honest statement about the best yes. team, you yes. know, for prep history there. Yes. <laughs> um, so before we move on to talk about some of your time after prep, is there any other special memories you'd like to share with us about your time as a student, whether it's <sighs> still from football or just academically or whatever you might I'd say academically, but also one of the things that made us such a good team is that we didn't just do one sport. Mm -hmm. You see so many kids specializing in one sport, and I'm just going to be the best baseball player or best football player. It's like, yeah, dang near everyone that played football did track. Yeah. So, like, I did shot put and discus. Ed Brown, who is still, I believe, has the record for discus at the school, and let alone our our four by one team took second in the state. Yeah. And we had the fastest guy in school history, Tim Dance, running the 10-5s. Jason Easter, Lustig, Hinkle, everyone did track, too. Yeah. So, and I think, well, I know Lustig, they wrestled as well. The yeah. Bray wrestled as well. So it's like the specialization of sports is something I've just never understood. I, I get it, but at the same time, like, it doesn't do well for people who are trying to become the best athletes they can be. Yeah. And the cross training is an important component of that. And I always tell folks, are you just a football player or are you an athlete? Right. Like we train to be athletes and right. the athleticism manifests itself on the football field and which enabled us to have the success that we did. Particularly if you're a skill position, running trash is gonna make you faster. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do it? Right. It only makes sense to <laughs> do something that's gonna help you increase your speed. Exactly. And that'll translate to the and field. And even Coach yeah. Mishler, he had the discus record before Ed broke it yeah. for a long time. So we yeah. came from a, a coach who did more than just one sport too. So right. it's only gonna make you better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I well, I'll say I played fre- football my freshman year, and then mm-hmm. that was it for me. I was not the biggest <laughs> as a kid. Uh, my sport was baseball. My that sport was happen, baseball. But you had, you had to figure it out. That's my, right. I tried out for baseball. Baseball was always my first love, and I got cut. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this track thing and just call it a day. <laughs> but I made the first cut, but second cut, not so lucky. That's funny. <laughs> so we're similar, just opposite sports, right? Exactly. And sizes, apparently. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's too funny. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, so so you graduate from prep, you yep. go to Penn State. Yep. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your experience? What it was like playing there? I mean, sorry, what thirty-one games, right? And um, you won a bowl game. Yes. Like just like just great accomplishments there as yes. your time there. Can you share with us a little bit about what that was like playing at Penn State? It was a great experience. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is that I was prepared for college football. Mm. So even going into high school, I was prepared for high school football because I come from an athletic family. Yeah. So my uncle, the man who I'm partially named after, his name's Charles Yogi Jones, he played middle linebacker at Pitt Yeah. back in the late 70s, early 80s with Dan Marino, Ricky Jackson, Hugh Green, and he was a three-year starter at middle linebacker, team captain on uh, his senior year at Pitt, and he became a college coach. Mm. And he coached, he has coached all over the country, coached at Pitt twice, coached at Rutgers, coached at Tulane. And as a little kid, like whenever he had opportunity, I would travel with him and go to some of the practices. So like when he was at Pitt, when Curtis Martin and Sean Gilbert were there. Oh, wow. So I had a chance to sit in on their practices yeah. and see them. And when it came time for me to be recruited, I knew what the game was. Yeah. And a lot, and actually, a lot of the coaches that recruited me knew him. Yeah, right. So they had a good relation, good relationships. And also, when it came to taking my official visits, we he he came with us. He came with me down to my Miami visit. Yeah, and helped inform my decision as what to look for in the school. And I was blessed to be recruited by a lot of the top programs in the nation. Yeah, and my final five were. Penn State, Michigan, Miami, UCLA, and Notre Dame. Wow. And 
the main premise that of which I used to view what school would be best for me was obviously an outstanding academic school, right? An outstanding sports program, an outstanding football school, and then also an outstanding alumni base. Because mm. I don't want to go to a school and get my degree and not be able to get a job once I graduate. <laughs> right. And Penn State fit the bill best. Yeah. And let alone the fact that it's the biggest alumni network in the world. So mm-hmm. I can go any place and say I have a Penn State degree is going to mean something. Right. And going to Penn State, wonderful experience. But at the same time, though, coming from my experience at Prep, as losing only six games during my high school career, five games were in one season, and four of those games were in a row mm. in 98. Yeah. I did not expect to go through the adversity that we experienced at Penn State during that time. Mm. So three out of the five years I was there, we had losing seasons. Wow. Didn't go to bowl games. And even in 2002... We underachieved. Mm. We had four first-round picks. Larry Johnson, who was a running back at that time, finished third in the Heisman. Arguably, I think he should have won the Heisman for running over 2,000 yards. But we still only finished with a 9-4 record. Yeah. With four first-round picks and two second-round picks. Right. And those subsequent years, my years that I actually wound up starting, (laughs) we went 3-9. and in 2003 and four and seven in 2004. Yeah. And I remember going into the last home game of 2004 and a reporter asked me during the press conference, like, is this what I expected? <laughs> and I kind of snapped. <laughs> I was like, absolutely not. Like, right. Like we had, so in 2003, 2004, we had two seven lo- game losing streaks. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I lost six games my whole high school career. Right. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. But, we had one. I had one more year, and we had a lot of talent that was returning back, and we were fortunate to be able to turn it around. Yeah. And 2005 was an outstanding year with Mike Robinson being the Big Ten MVP, influ, influx of young talent with Justin King, Derek Williams, and the maturation of Tony Hunt being a running back, as well as the the evolution of the defense. Yeah. When we had Paul Post Lesney being the defensive player of the year, Tom Bahali, um, first team all American, first round draft pick, and Alan Zamidis, second team all American, and going from the winning <laughs> seven games your previous two years to winning eleven games and being one second from winning all all your games. <sighs> Yeah. Michigan. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not bitter. You are. But but it was truly a wonderful way to end my my college career because, like I said, it wasn't what I expected beforehand, but people go to Penn State to win championships. And I'm glad to be able to say that I did that at, at that school. And I always feel great that I can go and walk into Beaver Stadium and look up on the side of the stadium and see 2005 as an accomplishment for what we did. Yeah. So it was, it, everything worked out well. So on you, top of being able to get my degree. So. Right, exactly. Mission accomplished. Now, when you say, um, you know, obviously, that was kind of a ridiculous question, but the reporter asked you if you met your expectations, right? That's what you expected. Yeah. yeah. Um, what did you learn through the adversity there that? got you through it (sighs) that you have to keep working at your your process Mm -hmm. that you have to continue to assess what you're doing make sure you're doing it right and eventually just try to work with like-minded individuals that are willing to work with you and have the same goals as you do and that's one of the reasons why I even chose Penn State in the first place because throughout the recruiting process, some coaches told me at some schools, either you're going to be a student or you're going to be an athlete. Mm. You're going to have to make a choice. I'm just like, no, I'm not. Right. I'm not coming to your yeah. school. <laughs> and that's the decision. <laughs> and thankfully, I was in the privileged position to have those options. But yeah. at the same time, you need to be everyone that's to be rolling in the right direction. Yeah. It's one of 
this old saying, I know Coach Paterno said it all the time, is that you'll be amazed by what you achieve if no one cares who gets, gets the credit. Mm -hmm. And that's how our team was. Yeah. And some versions of the team that I played on earlier, not so much. Yeah. But that 2005 team, like, we all cared about winning. All, like, as I said before, particularly when it comes to personal accolades, that, that stuff will take care of itself. Like, right. You can't worry about that. All you can control is what you can control. Yeah. And what we can control is how we prepared for various teams, whatever that opponent was, and go out and just have fun. Yeah. And you have fun by dominating. <laughs> and, we did, and we're able to do that. And, I, and I've heard a saying before, uh, either you win or you learn. It's not about losing. It's about what you learn in those experiences. Because if it wasn't for those years that you guys had with those losses, yeah. you guys wouldn't have had that hunger you did by that time. I, I don't know about that. Go ahead. Explain. Because I take it back to prep. Because that's one of the things I used to always <laughs> argue with my dad about. Because when we lost the state championship game in uh, 99 by one yeah. point on a block punt, yeah, I don't have a vivid memory, do I? No, but not at all. He always no he, 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 he would say that oh, we need to lose to be motivated to come back and win, and absolutely not. Hmm. Particularly our group, my seat, my class. Yeah, we didn't give up a point the whole year. Right. We do not need. We did not need motivation to win when we were winners. That's mm -hmm. all we knew. That's all we did. Yeah. So our objective, anytime we stepped on the field, was to win, hmm. and. Nine times out of ten, if you have a person with a money mindset, losing is only going. It's not going to motivate them more. It's going to make them. It might make them focus sure more intently, but it's not a requirement, right? Or necessary for them. Oh, now I lost. Now I gotta win. No, winning is what we do. Yeah, winning is what we did. Right. We don't. <laughs> we didn't have the two undefeated seasons during our time. Because we needed that extra motivation. Uh, that motivation is already there. Yeah. And it goes back to what I said about uh, the conversation we have with Joe, the Prey and I. It's like, we put more pressure on ourselves than anybody outside mm. of our program could have put on us. Yeah. Even the coaches. Right. Because that's what we wanted. Right. We wanted to win. We wanted the, the state championship rings. Everybody else, that's great. We appreciate the support. But we wanted it more for ourselves, more than anybody else. Yeah. Now, I know we're going to get into some success and leadership questions mm -hmm. that... And this kind of ties all right in with what, you know, that, that topic is because you're talking about being the type of person that you have a dominant, responsible mindset of, I'm going to win regardless. Like, you're that type of person, right? Like, right. I'm going to win. I'm going to succeed. Right. I think a lot of people who listen to the podcast are more that kind of person, right? Absolutely. They, they want to self-develop. They want to be better. They want to grow. And that's a prep mindset. That is too. a prep mindset. So, <laughs> yeah. It's actually great. It's ingrained in who we are. Correct. Yeah. So, how do you continue to grow in that hunger? How do you continue to develop that? How do you continue to strive for more? Because when I read, when I was working on your bio and reading yes. it off prior to you coming, I'm like, man, this guy had a hunger to keep chasing that ladder, keep striving for success. Mm -hmm. And um, hear, hearing you talk, it's no surprise as mm -hmm. to where you are in your career today because it's, it's just, that's who you are. I think it comes down to, there's always new challenges to be had. Mm -hmm. And it's another coach paternal axiom. Either you, you get better, you get worse, you never stay the same. Mm -hmm. So if I could say, oh, well, I've been doing this for X amount of years, but it's like, well, how have you improved? Right. Have you gotten better every single day or I'm, I'm just here? I'm like, no. Yeah. You don't just stay there because A, you always change. Mm -hmm. It's your choice and it's incumbent upon you whether you get better or you get worse. And... Particularly with the achievement per se, yeah, it's never about the achievement in and of itself. It's about the improvement, mm. and it's one of those things. It's like kind of the football analogy: playing the perfect game. The perfect game is unattainable, but yet you still strive to try to find that perfect game, and mm. you hold yourself to the standard of the perfect game, knowing that you're never going to achieve it. Right. But you still work regardless to improve yourself, to improve your community, to improve anyone that you're associated with, because everyone else, not just you, will be better off moving forward. Mm. And it's changing that mindset of, yes, you're happy, but never satisfied. Mm. Happy, but never satisfied. Correct. Right. There's, there's, always... Al there's always more to do. So what drives you to that? What is the more for you? 
more for me personally is one making sure that I'm doing everything I'm doing for God, making mm-hmm. sure I'm doing everything that I'm doing for that my family is better off, making sure that I'm doing what I'm doing to make sure that the people I care about are better off. Yeah. Making sure the institutions that I work for or work with are better off and knowing that there's always more people to help. Yeah. And particularly being mm-hmm. from Erie, seeing the ebbs and flows of how the community I love so much is doing. Yeah. Is one of those things where I know there's more work to do. Yeah. And that's why I appreciate the opportunity to well, to be on the board, number one, but two, to be the first black alumni mm-hmm. on the board. Yeah. Which is, I still find extremely humbling. Yeah. And to be able to work with the Mother Teresa Academy. Yeah. To know how many kids' lives are better by what we do at that school. Yeah. To make sure that we're exposing them, giving them proper learning environment, and giving them the tools to be able to maximize their potential. Yeah. When, unfortunately, there's not nearly enough options. Yeah. Within the inner city of Erie to make sure those kids are getting the services that they need to succeed. Right. So. Yeah. No, that's great to hear because, I mean, like I was kind of alluding to when I was referencing your bio, like Mm -hmm. working hard, trying to be successful. And a lot of times I like to, when I get a chance to talk to you, I ask them, what drives you? You know, what is it that you're so passionate about that, you know, motivates you? And it's great to hear, you know, your reasons why is it's something bigger than yourself, yes. right? It's always about building towards something else. It's about building to something else, but at the same time, too, it's just, like, I know I've been so blessed. Yeah. And it'd be one thing that people, you hear those also self-made people and self-made men, <laughs> that's a bunch of bull. <laughs> and if I got on here and said that same thing, I'd be lying through my teeth because there's so many people that took a liking to me and deemed their time deem me worthy of their time and investment yeah particularly within my family because like i said with my uncle preparing me for football wise particularly like for my current profession as being an attorney yeah my godfather yeah my godfather's name is Ulysses Payne. he was a basketball player so as I said before, I came from an athletic family. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy were kind of nice, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean to brag, but... Exactly. I, I, I kind of came about it, honestly. <laughs> and Prep helped hardest it, but he was a basketball player. He was on Marquette's national championship team back in 1975. Mm. Was drafted to the NBA by the Pistons. Wow. And didn't work out, so he went back to Marquette and went to law school there. Wow. And worked his way up. Got graduated from Marquette with his law degree, worked his way up, became the managing partner of Foley and Larner, which is the largest law firm uh, based out of Milwaukee. And he left there to become the first black president of a major league baseball team, mm. of the Milwaukee Brewers. Wow. So not only wow. did he do that, but at the same time, too, like his primary practice was international trade, mm. hence yes. international trade for me. And while he was traveling, when I was a kid, he would send me postcards from everywhere he went. Wow. So from India, from Taiwan, or from China. So nine years old, at my home, Lower West Side, Fourth and Cherry, looking at postcards from around the world. Yeah. And it's just broadening my horizon to see that there's so much more to the world than just Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm. And not only was his professional success something that I aspire to, but at the same time, if you met him, he is absolutely the most humble, down-to-earth person you will ever meet. Oh, wow. So it's like, so I can attain all this worldly success, but at the same time, still be a great person, still want to help people, yeah. and still make a positive force within my community. That's the way that you need to be. Yeah. You need to be approachable and just need to be able to relate to people because you... I know you come across some people that have had achieved some success and they have this air about them that they're untouchable. And yeah. It's like, who are you helping by having that attitude? Right. When you, I can't say what people need to be, but why would you want to carry yourself that way? Yeah. When you could help somebody. Right. And that, that's just the way I feel about it, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, just it, listening. It, I, I can't, I don't want to judge people by the way they want to do it, but that's just how I do it. Right. So. 
And I would say just listening to you talk, I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, I can personally and I would hope listeners can pick up on is right. the way that you go about your life and the standard of excellence you do anything with. And right. that's something I've always been a big proponent is, is that, that, you know, something I hope to teach my kids that when you choose to do something, you do it to the fullest extent of your ability. Correct. There's no half, half butting it, I'll say. Right, really. right, right. There, no taking off, right? I yes. mean, you got to, if you decide to do something, you do it full force. And then if you decide you don't want to pursue it after that, God bless you. But exactly. when you choose to do something, you go it all the way in. Right. Yeah. Um, so everything you've accomplished and you've seen and done, um, adversities and successes, mm -hmm. what is your definition of success? What does that mean to you? Success is still the outward perception of achievement versus excellence. Mm -hmm. which is more important to me, knowing that I'm doing the best that I can in this whatever said vocation or whatever said um, mm -hmm. task right. that you're doing. And success is something that I've never been really, I've never really chased. It's just knowing that I want to make sure that the people I care about are taken care of. Mm. And whatever vehicle I can use to be able to make sure that they're physically, mentally, emotionally, financially secure. Right. That's what I'm going to do. Because there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said. Because I, I absolutely, when I think of success, I go to more of an external spot of an achievement or an accomplishment right. or a place in life versus what you were saying and you alluded to earlier, success versus excellence. And you were talking about that. So the excellence that you speak of, mm -hmm. what does it mean to live your life in a pursuit of excellence each day? I think it's a lot of it's internal and a lot of it is just pushing yourself one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, where it's like, what am I doing to get better? Yeah. And <laughs> it can sound a little obsessive. <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> but at the same time though, it's just it's it's that mentality of of football. That's why I appreciate the sport so much because it truly has made me who I am. Yeah. Because like the actual games themselves are one thing, but it's the meticulous preparation mm -hmm. that goes into it. Particularly when the time that was allocated towards football during my college time. Yeah. Because if you break it down and really think about it, you we spend probably 300 plus days a year preparing for 36 hours. Right. Right. <laughs> when you it. really break that down. That's it. Yeah. Waking up at 5... Uh, or I could say waking up at 540. Running at 545 in the morning. Doing countless lifts all prepared for 12 Saturdays. Yeah. Three hours on Saturday. Right. And that's it. And that... I heard a quote, and it's the best way I've ever heard it described in one sentence, is is that every day is important, but only 12 days count. Mm. <laughs> 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 and you think about it like that, it's like, oh, it's kind of correct. Right. <laughs> and with that mentality, granted, it's not counting for those 12 Saturdays anymore. But it's preparing for when you're dealing with a client, dealing with a situation, dealing with helping out yeah. the organization. Right. It's making sure that you're prepared to be able to help them in whatever situation they might be involved in. Case in point, when the Ukra uh, Ukraine conflict kicked off back in February, yeah, my firm assembled a Ukraine conflict task force and mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be named to it and we we're helping oh, wow. numerous companies from around the world adjust to managing their operations in Russia mm -hmm. and by having that mindset our team was able to be able to help them adjust develop whether it be transfer some of their operations or end their operations sell off their operations to other Russian companies that could continue them. It's just being prepared for whatever moment might arise because particularly being an attorney, it, it, it's coming. <laughs> it's going to happen. 
Yeah. But it's just so applicable to so many other walks of life. Yeah. And that's why that you have so many advocates for people or kids playing sports because they really do prepare you for life, let alone the teamwork, dealing with people from different cultures, different ethnicities, different races that you might not ever come across if right. you don't play the various sports or even just traveling as well in and of itself. It's like that different exposure yeah. to different people that aren't like you only makes you better. Right. If you're secure with who you are. Yeah. Well, and a, a common theme I've also picked up on is you're really big on process and preparation. Mm -hmm. And it's never about, like, it seems like winning's winning, failure's failure, but your pursuit of excellence and how you get there is meticulous preparation. Mm -hmm. process and it's funny because I could I could be somebody listening to this pod and be like wow I'm not Charles Rush I don't think like he thinks I mean this dude is crazy like he's talking all this great stuff but I'm not him <laughs> but when you really boil it down you're not talking about anything crazy no. you're talking about you do small things every day yes. but you do them every day yeah and when you talk about the the I quote I try to do them every day how about that <laughs> yeah exactly it's always, not perfect. Oh, exactly. It's, it's always it's always an effort yes and, and that's, I think, the key that, you know, for for anybody listening to this, it's that you have to understand it's not about these big moments where you're sitting in that board meeting talking about the Ukraine-Russia thing. It's about all those little things that led up to you being in that seat at that moment. And that the coach paternal will ask you, you take care of the little things, the big things will take care of themselves. Yeah. So just echo, I'd say, a lot of encouragement for anybody sitting here thinking, I want to be better. I want to achieve more. I want to do more. Um, but I don't think like that dude thinks. It's not about that big picture stuff. It's about the little everyday things. And that's exactly. what I picked up on a lot of what you've been right. talking about is that's what you're so big on is the pursuit of excellence is an everyday process. Correct. Yes. And it, it never stops. And yeah. it's one of those things where it's like, oh, dang, can I take a break? And it's like, you need to for your mental yeah. health and mental acuity. But at the same time, though, it's just knowing that there's work to be done and you, no one's going to do it if you don't do it. At the same time, though, too, it's not like you're got to be some superhuman, or you're, or, or yeah, I or other people have some special right. power. It's like, no, it's just it's stuff that anyone can do. Right, anyone can do. When I was going to ask, how do you view challenges? Do you see them as something that um, is an obstacle in the way, or do you feel like it's just a, a, a bump in the road? Like, how do you view a challenge? And has there been moments in your life that they came in the way of your pursuits of excellence mm -hmm. and caused you to do something a little different. I mean, it, it, it depends on what it is. Yeah. It's like anything else. You, you identify what it is, you assess it, and then you act accordingly as to what is best for you. It's like you live life long enough that there are going to be challenges that come in your way. Right. I remember, I think it was an NFL Films clip with Chris Carter and Randy Moss. Just, it was during one of the games, I think Randy Moss dropped a pass and... Chris Carter was like, every good man I know has been through something. Mm -hmm. And correct, every good man, every good woman, you live life long enough, you're going to go through something. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much, I know you probably heard, it's like it's not so much about what happens to you, it's how you react to it. Right. And that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. It's how you react to it, but also, and particularly this is where I know and acknowledge my privilege is that not only have things happened to me, but I know I have a support system and a safety mm -hmm. net of people who help support me, right. who have helped me through various things uh, with in my life and along my ride. Right. And through that safety net, I am empowered to take more risk. Yeah. And try various things mm -hmm. that other people who don't have that guidance or that background or that safety net would not be able to try. And particularly within my role as a director or prep, I want to make sure that all of our students right. have that safety net in whatever way possible to make sure that they're taking possible risks that could help make them that much better and enable them to maximize their potential in knowing that they have a support system that's behind them 110% to make sure that any sign or any way that they falter will be there to help them, particularly when they leave the school. Right. Because one of the biggest things about prep, particularly if you're in Erie, Pennsylvania, prep is everywhere. Yeah. 
and not just in on the sports pages, but in the boardrooms, in the 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 sur the surgery rooms, everywhere. Yeah. Prep is affiliated, and as we know, oftentimes it's not what you know, but who you know. Yeah, and we want that prep network to be available and accessible to every single person that matriculates through these halls. Right, and that starts with introducing our seniors, our juniors, our sophomores to the people who eventually might be their employers. Right. Getting them acclimated to going into the workforce uh, uh, eventually. Yeah. And it just goes back to the exposure piece. Yeah. I was fortunate because I've had so much exposure, not just in the city with my dad being former deputy mayor of the town. Right. But also just internationally, being able to travel to France before, while, while I was at Erie Day, to Germany while I was at prep, and now to Hong Kong for yeah. my LLM degree. But I want to give as many kids who want that exposure, that exposure, yeah. so they can see what else is outside of Erie. And that's not to say so they can leave Erie, no. Right, but to get exposed to see what else is outside of Erie, so whatever ideas that they gain while they're outside, they can bring back to Erie to help make Erie a better place, right, and to improve it. Yeah, and ultimately, I wanted them to choose if they want to stay or whether they go. But I'd rather that be a fully informed decision right. versus, oh, I've never been anyplace else, so I don't want to leave. Like, that's not exactly the best way to go about it. Yeah, particularly when we know that so many people within the Erie community have never lived anyplace else. Yeah. And that's not to disparage those individuals, but it's at the same time, particularly with my mom having been from Pittsburgh and came to Erie. Yeah. When I was of age in high school, she told me point blank, you're not staying in Erie for college. Yeah. You're going. You're not going to <laughs> Gannon. You're not going to Edinburgh. You're not going to Mercer's. You're not going to uh, Penn State Barron. You have to leave town. Yeah. It's just so you can get a different exposure. Yeah. Now, if you choose to come back, great. Right. That's fine. That's that's on you. But you have to leave to see what else is out there in this world. And there's so much in this world to be seen. Mm. And having that experience, and particularly being able to come back to Erie with that experience, is only going to make the town that much better. Right. And that's ultimately, I know it's what you want to see. It's what I want to see. Yep. And Because this is home. Yeah. Like, I've lived <laughs> all around <laughs> the world. I've lived in New York, lived in... Chicago, lived in Philadelphia, currently living outside in uh, Washington, D.C. Only one place is home, and that's Erie, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And whatever I can do to help my hometown, I'm, I'm going to do. And it's awesome the fact that you are on the board because you bring those outside perspectives and experiences that you've had that right. if you just stayed here all your life, you wouldn't have had. Correct. And there's a great value in that. Um, so as we start to kind of transition out of, um, I should say transition, start to close out on the podcast, a yep. um, couple other questions for you in wrapping up. Yes. Um, so this episode is going to be coming out on January 2nd, okay. right? So it's going to be a lot about people thinking New Year's resolutions, yes. 2023 is going to be the new year, new me, right? Right, right, right. Um, So my question for you is what advice would you give for somebody in setting new goals for themselves and going about achieving them? Set them and do them. Don't yeah. wait until the new year because that's just time that could be allocated to you actually fortifying whatever set goal that you want that could become a habit by then. Yeah. So just do it. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> as we all know, we've lived enough, uh, we've yes. been through enough New Year's, nothing magically happens on New Year's. Nothing. Oh, now, now I'm going to do it. That's now, great. The calendar says Exactly. It. Now, Same you. you. You just have to do it. And once you do it and you start going about it, it becomes a habit and it becomes that much easier moving forward. But it's like every journey, just, it starts with the first step. That's right. And first step's it. the hardest. It is. You just got to go though. It is. But once you get going to get the momentum, and particularly once you have the support of some people who are trying to help you yeah. in doing it. And I know, now mind you, I'm guilty of not being the most communicative when it comes to various goals, but that can be a way for people to help motivate each other. Yeah. Just communicating what they want to do so some people can hold you accountable for mm -hmm. it. Right. But it's always, it's always it's something that you need to learn, see what works for you. Yeah. Moving forward, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. All right, last question for you. You yep. provided so many good things that uh, I've been taking notes as we were talking, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate all you shared with us. 
So, so last question, you know, uh, if you can go back in time yep. and knowing what you know now, yep. go back and speak to, at your graduation to your prep classmates, what message or advice would you leave with your classmates on that day? I say two things, and I say two things because it's things I'm extremely guilty of, of not doing. Yeah. One, live in the moment. Mm. Appreciate it. Enjoy it. Don't always be looking towards the next thing. Because like I said, I'm super guilty of that. Like, I don't <laughs> sit, wait, and just embrace mm. so many things that have gone on. And particularly, I've been so blessed where I have enjoyed a fair amount of success, particularly athletically and professionally. Yeah. Where it's like, I don't just sit with that. Yeah. And just appreciate it. Particularly, like, particularly, especially with high school, I say, one, like, don't live in a, like, live in a moment. Yeah. Two, maintain your connections with your high school friends. Mm. Check on them every now and then. I've gotten better with it, but it's something that I didn't do enough of. Mm. And it's one of those things that I can still always, more I think I can do. Yeah. Because, like, it's a brotherhood and now a sisterhood. Right. That is never going to leave you. It's always going to be there. These four years, and granted, they're only four years, but it's form years are some of the most transformative years of your life. Yeah. And one thing that I'll say, and not something that I despise <laughs> very greatly, is when people say, oh, high school is the best years of your life. If high school is the best years of your life, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> high school is a great time in your life. And if anybody can say that, that's you. It, right? <laughs> right. It's a great time in your life. Like, I had a great time in high school, but I just have the mindset is that I have yet to have the best years of my life. Mm. Like, there's so much more life to live, so much more things to achieve, so much more people to help, so many more places to go. Yeah. That I'm just getting started. I think that's awesome how it ties in with what we were just talking about. This is coming out on January 2nd. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the best year for people, Correct. whether they even know it or not. Correct. You just make that decision right. that 2023 is going to be my year because right. I'm starting today and deciding this right. is going to be the best year. Yeah. Not last year, not right. 10 years ago, right. not high school. And you can't change that. That's right. But you can change today, you can change tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. That's what you can control. So do what you best you can to control it. Absolutely. Yes. That's good stuff. Well, again, I thank you so much for your time with us today, nah, sitting on the J podcast. Jimmy, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's, it's, I appreciate what you're doing with the podcast. And as we were talking about before we started, like, it's the vehicle for people who are not in town to make, remain connected to the school because, yep. thankfully, we Ramblers we're worldwide, we're all over. That's and right. There's so much love for our school out there that I don't think enough people in Erie appreciate and understand is that we not in town, the who aren't in town, just have as much love for the people who are in town yeah. for our school because we know we would not be who we are had we not gone through our four years at this school. And I'm excited for the new transition of the new Cathedral Prep moving yeah. forward in the fact that it's not, it's a different, trajectory it's a different school it doesn't it definitely doesn't make it inferior or better if you're something like that oh it's not the same prep it's not the same prep right it's a good thing yeah it's an evolution of prep mm. and it's a new prep for the 21st century let alone the new science center the salada technology center it's all absolutely amazing <laughs> right oh my goodness yes I was talking to Coach Cray yesterday we were talking about how prep looked like a dungeon. <laughs> we were there. And to see what they've done so far and Mr. Salata's amazing contribution to our to our school. Yeah. It's like it cannot be understated. The lives that are gonna be impacted for the better Absolutely. by us having that new facility. And we're just getting started with what we're going to be doing for this community. It's gonna be amazing. So exciting, great times and um, I have two sons, two daughters, mm -hmm. so for me to know that they both are going to have the prep experience, a new one, a right. different one than you and I had, Correct. but they're going to have the prep experience, Absolutely. and it's going to be a beautiful thing. So yeah, I appreciate all you're doing with the board between yes. prep and MTA, 
your, your time serving the school, the community, and, and being involved still today. Um, no, we appreciate you, Charles, and thank you again for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Anytime. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. Yeah. Hello again, everyone, and thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Rambler Podcast. Uh, Charles was such an awesome guest, as you got to hear, uh, for kicking off uh, the podcast with the new year for 2023. Uh, he provided us with some great advice on how we can all make this our best year yet. So wanted to let you know that the episode 13 of the Rambler Podcast will be coming out on January 16th and will feature the Assistant Vice President of Academics and Student Affairs, Veronica Seat. Veronica is going to talk to us about how she ended up working for Villa a few years ago, what she does in her role for the school, and how this school year for the new Cathedral Prep has been going. So stay tuned for that episode coming out later this month. Uh, but I want to thank you all for listening to the podcast. God bless and roll Ramblers.